But this Friday edition of The Current begins with a madhouse in Madison. That's what it sounds like at Wisconsin State Capitol building these days. Governor Scott Walker's proposed budget bill has prompted huge protests from public sector union workers. And Governor Walker says he will start issuing layoff notices to state workers today if his bill taking away collective bargaining rights from public sector unions is not passed. Our state cannot grow if our people are weighed down paying for a larger and larger government. A government that pays its workers unsustainable benefits that are out of line with the private sector. We need a leaner and cleaner state government. Governor Walker's fight with Wisconsin's public sector unions has sparked a heated debate all over the United States, and it has Canadian unions taking note as well. Margot Young is a researcher with the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE. She was part of a delegation that went to Wisconsin to support the public sector unions there. What really struck me when I got there and walked in the Capitol building is how peaceful and how it, uh, inspiring it was. They've put up these beautiful posters and messages from all over the world sort of supporting them in their protest. You know, it's quite inspiring. You know, there's music and the crowd cheers and one of the unusual cheers they have is they like to cheer, thank you. They're very polite. It just has a really positive feeling of people drawing a line in the sand. Well, financial constraints, budget battles and elections are looming in several provinces and municipalities across Canada. And some say it's time to try a Wisconsin-style approach to balancing government books. But others say that targeting public sector unions is the wrong approach. For both sides of that debate, we're joined by two guests. Kevin Gaudet is with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. He's in Toronto. And Marie Clark Walker is the Executive Vice President of the Canadian Labour Congress. She's in Toronto as well. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Kevin Goddard, I want to start with you. You've been quoted as saying uh, that we need a Wisconsin-style approach here in Canada. How so? Well, thank you for having me on this morning. Uh, the context of my comments are federal, provincial, and municipal governments across the country running substantial deficits at all levels of government, as I mentioned, and a federal debt, for example, that's already $560.5 billion in size, um, not to mention an unfunded liability of public federal public sector employees of another $208 billion. So the backdrop for the conversation about public sector pay is how do we go about balancing our budgets? How do we go about doing that? We need to have a national conversation to make some hard decisions about what spending priorities ought to be. And part of that conversation, given that roughly half of all public spending, which is taxpayer spending, goes to salaries, wages and benefits for employees, that needs to be on the table. But do you support things like the, like the governor in Wisconsin has in his bill, like rolling back collective bargaining rights in order to balance budgets in Canada? Well, I think what needs to happen first is that everybody needs to go to the bargaining table and respect the collective bargaining rights of organized labor and have those conversations. Ideally, some of that would, uh, would trickle down and we would avoid having to get to that point. Um, so the first step would be to have meaningful, reasonable collective bargaining bargaining conversations, and all these things need to be on the table. So the first step isn't to bring out the cudgel. Um, however, if if it gets to a point where unions are asking, as they have been for years now at the public sector level, rates of increase for wages at three and four times the rate of inflation, already well beyond their private sector counterparts, already at levels that taxpayers can't afford, then I suppose that's that's in the that is in the public sector uh, quiver of arrows, just like it is for the public sector unions to have uh, strikes in their quiver. And I, I don't think labor would probably first go straight to strikes, just like government shouldn't first go straight to depriving in unions of collective well, bargaining. Let, let me bring in Marie Clark Walker here to respond to what you're saying there, Kevin Gaudet. Thanks, Pia. Well, I want to start by saying that it wasn't the workers who caused this problem. It was Wall Street, Bay Street, big bankers, big corporations that cause a financial crisis, and workers are being asked to pay for it over and over and over again, and that's not our role. I actually agree with Kevin when he says, yes, we need to go to the bargaining table. That's the way we get most of our issues dealt with. 
very, very rarely do we end up in a strike position or lockout position. So yes, going to the bargaining table. I do not agree that the wage increases have been you know, astronomical. On average, they're about 1.2%. And in terms of uh, wages with the public sector and the private sector, pay levels are very, very similar. And oftentimes you find that pay levels in the private sector are actually more, particularly for men. Women and new immigrants, recent immigrants, tend to be lower down on the scale. Well, let me ask you this. As rep- representative of the Canadian Labour Congress, is organized labour, especially public sector unions, when you look at what's happening in Wisconsin and is moving to Ohio and, and other places in the U.S., are you worried by what you're seeing? We're extremely worried, particularly when we have mayors like Rob Ford talking about privatize, privatize, privatize every time he opens his mouth. Uh, Our workers are providing good services and when you talk about cutting taxes and cutting workers, you're cutting services to the middle and working class people of this of this country and since we're in Toronto, of this city. And that's really unfair. You know, um, I do a lot of work in the communities and when People hear that they're going to get money put back in their pockets, which was the case, you know, last year before municipal elections. They were all very happy. But when I sit with them and I say, okay, you're going to get $60 back. What are you prepared to give up for that $60? That was a vehicle registration tax. They look at me with this puzzled face. What do you mean, what do I have to give up? Well, if you're going to get money back, it means that money's not going towards something that you, you know, you value in this city. So are you, what are you willing to give up? And when they hear that conversation, it's really hard for them to give up anything you know they well I want you mentioned Rob Ford Toronto's mayor I want to play a bit of tape for both of you to listen to Rob Ford campaigned on a promise to privatize garbage pickup and he's already notified the garbage workers union at Toronto City Hall his desire to contract out their services let's take a listen we're doing this so we're not going to go through another 40-day garbage strike like we did last year we're going to save millions of dollars and we're going to reduce the size of government Kevin Godet, do you see Rob Ford as a Governor Scott Walker-like figure uh, here in Canada? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I know he's being painted that way, just like I guess Brian Mulroney was and Ronald Reagan were in the respective periods, except that so far Mr. Ford hasn't undertaken the, the budget tightening that all people talk about. Um, I mean, it's interesting. The mayor of Windsor fought his garbage strike successfully and has balanced his budget, and we see today the mayors of West Mountain, Montreal, for example, going to their respective premiers saying to Mr. Charest that the public sector pension plans in the city of Montreal and West Mount aren't affordable to their municipal taxpayers and they're asking Mr. Charest to do something about it. So the challenging question is, given that we're running giant deficits, what is it we'd like to do? What taxes does organized labor want raised to pay for this? What further taxes do they want so when we talk about what we're going to give up, um, needs to be on the table the recognition that when these, these organizations ask for more money, that what they're really asking for is tax hikes. Well, Marie Clark Walker, I, I want to just stick with the Rob Ford Toronto Mayor example just, just for a moment here. You know, C.D. Howe study last year found that citywide trash privatization in Toronto could save $49 million per year. So what's wrong with cities that, that are broke across Canada turning to the private sector to save some money? First of all, we were, we believe that that report is is faulty. It's flawed. Um, we have seen time and time again when you privatize things, we tend to, to pay more. You end up canceling contracts. You end up with a 407 type thing where we paid for it and we're still paying for it because they felt that the private sector could do it better. But we're we're constantly constantly paying um, with respect to. Windsor and Toronto and garbage strikes and unions, I think it's important, as Kevin has said, to sit down and have a conversation with the unions before we have any kind of discussion about essential services, privatization, anything like that. And the fact is, with regards to money, we are saying to these workers who provide a valuable service that we want to cut your benefits, cut your salary, cut your jobs, take your jobs away, but we're continuing to cut corporate taxes. If we're in such a bad financial situation, why are we cutting f- corporate taxes? This is the time to be either adhering to those taxes or raising corporate taxes, not putting it on the backs of people who make $30,000 a year. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. Kevin Gaudet, you are with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, what about all these tax uh, breaks? Well, we've been reducing corporate taxes on businesses for a while now um, for two reasons. One, to make 
the business is more competitive because they're the ones actually that put in place the jobs that people get paid for. Um, and while they did it, tax revenue climbed. And the only time tax revenue declined was during the the recession of the last two years. And it's already starting to climb again despite tax rates going down. And then relatedly, I'd also like to remind you that it's not the businesses that pay the taxes. All businesses, a tax on a business is just a cost of doing business. And all it does is pass that cost back to consumers. So we can talk about raising business taxes as much as we want. All that does is raise the cost of goods and services for those people around who who actually have to pay it. Kevin um, Goddard, are you are you seeing, I, I just want to move this this outside of Toronto a little bit, but are you seeing this desire to reduce the size of government and, and to privatize public sector jobs elsewhere in Canada? I think there's a, a growing challenge by all elected officials who are facing budget deficits to come up with creative ways to balance those budgets. And that should involve a variety of conversations, uh, and they need to be transparent conversations because too often some of this stuff gets sprung on people, including organized labor, after the fact. Um, and, and that involves outsourcing, privatization, uh, user fees, and and should also include the conversation around uh, increasing taxes. I mean, you know what my position probably would be on the increasing <laughs> taxes, but I do think the public should have their say on it. And and. Organized labor should be part of that conversation because they're an important stakeholder. Murray Clark Walker, you know, unions are being painted as fat cats um, and other various uh, ways. How much is this an image problem for unions of not being able to get their message across? Uh, are unions in Canada under threat? I think we are under threat, and I think there there are a lot of things that we have been doing to get our message out clearer. As I said, one of the things that we have talked about is that with with seniors and with community groups, what that $60 would mean to them and what they're prepared to give up. And when you talk to them about what it means in terms of losing community centres, lo- losing senior centres, losing programmes, losing weekly garbage collection, they actually understand that the things that we're doing as unions are to protect entire communities, not just to protect our members. And a good example of that is our Canada Pension Plan um, campaign, where I mean, most of us have private private pensions. We're pushing to make sure that those people, 93% of us, who pay into the CPP can actually retire with dignity and with respect. That's not something that's just for our members. That's something that we do for everyone. And a lot of the things that we do is not about strikes. It's not about lockouts. It's not about walking picket lines. It's not about pay raises. It's about making the lives of working class and middle class people in this country and others a better, just better, and making our communities better. Canada certainly is not Wisconsin. At least that's one point Bill Robson, president of the C.D. Howe Institute, would like to make. We asked him to compare what's happening in Wisconsin to Canada, and here's what he had to say. We're facing something similar in Canada, but it's not as severe as in the United States for a couple of reasons. First, many of the pension promises that have been made in Canada have been a little bit less lavish. Uh, You don't, for example, in Canada have these extraordinary situations, uh, such as uh, in some U.S. states where people's pension would be based on their final year of salary, so there'd be a job hop in the final year, a a much higher salary, and then a much higher pension on the basis of that. Uh, We don't have that, and many of the pension plans that we do have are better funded to begin with. So the same problem exists here in Canada, but it's not nearly as acute. Kevin Gaudet, do you agree that there are significant differences between the U.S. and a situation in ours when it comes to public sector unions? Well, I think Dr. Robson pointed out... Uh, one example of an important distinction. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there are. I got to be honest. I'm, I'm not as aware of what all those distinctions entail. I do know, for example, that public sector employees, generally speaking, enjoy a seventy, uh, a pension, seventy percent of the average of the best five years of income. Um, that is so far and away beyond anything anybody in the private sector gets, except perhaps a bank president. And again, uh, I, I think going forward, we're going to see types of challenges where you have neighbors living beside each other where people may be retired because they used to work in the public sector they can retire at the age of five where those people working in the private sector have to work to 67 or 70 to enjoy a pension that would be half or a third or even a quarter as lucrative as their neighbors and I think that type of resentment will cause challenges going forward which is why we need to deal with the issue now. Well, Bill Robson from the C.D. Howe Institute also crunched some numbers about pensions and found that if the Canadian government had to pay out all of their pension obligations tomorrow, they would be short by $208 billion. Here's a bit more of what he had to say on that topic. 
day to day, month to month, it's always very tempting for both management and for labor to put a little bit less money into the pension plan because that leaves more money over for other things, including current compensation. And in the public sector, where the accounting for pensions has been pretty loose, it's been very, very tempting to do that. So we do have this underfunding of public sector pensions right around the world right now. Uh, countries are being faced with the need to look more squarely at what these promises they've made are worth and on the one hand fund them better so that the money is going to be there to pay them but on the other hand look ahead and say is this really the right way to run uh, the operation wouldn't we be better off paying higher salaries in the here and now to our public sector and not making these promises to pay pensions in the future that might be hard to uh, live up to. Marie Clark Walker when we get into hard numbers like 208 billion dollar shortfall if pension obligations had to be paid out tomorrow How do you convince taxpayers that strong public sector pensions are are a good thing rather than perhaps what Bill Robson just suggested, paying higher rate wages than generous pension benefits? First of all, let me just make it very, very clear that the pensions that public sector workers get are their deferred earnings. It's earnings that they, the employer keeps back every paycheck um, and contributes The employer does contribute a part of it, but it's their deferred earnings. It's their earnings after working, in some cases, decades, decades, 20, 30, 40 years at a particular place where they have helped to build the company, they have built the the country, and and we have people telling us that these people who have worked this hard for this long don't deserve to retire with dignity. Let me just give you a number. On average, a woman in the public sector will retire on less than $1,500 a month. That's not gold-plated. That's not anything that, you know, I think most people who live in Toronto can live on. So we have to put that into perspective. What we're asking for in terms of our pension plan is our pension campaign is to increase and enhance the Canada Pension Plan. 93% of us already pay into it. If we increase it gradually over seven years, to the fact to a doubling of our contribution and the workers' contribution and the employers' contribution, then no one will have to retire in poverty. Increasing the GIS by 15% right now will mean that those people who are living at $12,000 a year will be bumped up so to, to above the poverty line. That is not ridiculous. That is not um, pushing the envelope by any means, I don't think. Kevin Goddard, are pensions your biggest concern when it comes to public sector unions? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, our mandate is lower taxes, less waste, more accountable government. We advocate on behalf of our 69,000 supporters across the country. Uh, the cost of government is our main priority, and the cost of public sector, public sector labor is only one element of it, whether or not it's organized or not organized. Uh, we would argue that governments over decades have offered too many programs with too many employees who, generally speaking, get paid too well. But are pensions the biggest concern of that? Uh, Well, I think pensions are a very large component of it. When you look at a Canadian Federation of Independent Business study, it indicates that uh, municipal, provincial, and federal workers all get paid more than their private sector counterparts in in increasing amounts, both less municipally, more provincially, and exceedingly federally. Um, And I I just think that is one element that needs to be on the table for conversation about how we're going to deal with a federal deficit of $45 billion, the Ontario deficit's $18.7 billion. And I keep coming back to the same question is, how do we want to balance these budgets if we don't put on the table everything, including uh, wages, for example? Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Kevin Gaudet is the federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and Marie Clark Walker is the executive vice president of the Canadian Labour Congress. Thank Thank you, Pia. Thank you very much.